I'm Raleigh Flynn. I'm the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. And um, this afternoon, we will be looking at the future of Germany's foreign policy uh, with the new three-way coalition government that's just been installed in Germany. Um, to do that, we have FBRI's Executive Director for the Center of the Study of America in the West, uh, Ronald Granieri, as well as FBI's editor of Orbis, Nicholas Gvozdev. Um, this should be a very interesting discussion with, with both of them. And um, before I turn it over to them, I would like to uh, mention a couple of upcoming events. This Thursday, December 9th at 11, from 11 a.m. to 12, uh, we will have FBRI's senior fellow, John Maurer, uh, who is a noted historian who has written a new book on FDR and the road to Pearl Harbor. Uh, this should be a really interesting discussion. I would note that one of the chapters in this book was written by uh, Walter McDougall, our um, esteemed uh, historian and distinguished senior fellow, as well as the chair of FBRI's board of advisors. Um, on Tuesday, December 14th, from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., we're going to have a really interesting discussion on Parag Khanna's new book, with Parag Khanna, uh, his new book, Move, The Forces Uprooting Us, uh, looking at this new age of mass migrations. Uh, and this will be part of our um, series, People, Politics, and Prose, uh, featuring FBRI's Ron Granieri, again. Um, so uh, before I turn over the reins, I would just like to remind everybody to put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, ideally in the Q&A, not the chat, although in truth, we'll look in the chat too, if you put them in there. Um, uh, without further ado, let me turn it over to Ron. You're muted, Ron. There's the unmute button. Thank you. Sorry about that, everybody. Welcome. Thanks, Raleigh, for bringing us in here. And thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, I will say, and uh, Nick maybe may want to join me on this, is that uh, any opinions that you hear expressed by either him or me are our own and not those of the United States government, the Department of Defense, or basically anybody else except for the two guys that you see right now. That's right. Just keep shaking your head, Nick. That's yeah. right. It's just, we are, these are our opinions. Um, the Germans have been very helpful to us in that um, uh, they decided to make today the day of the constitutive meeting of the Bundestag. And so the new government led by Olaf Scholz was literally sworn in earlier today. So as of noon, Germany time, Angela Merkel is no longer Chancellor, uh, Olaf Scholz is chancellor at the head of this traffic light coalition. So we did have one conversation here at FPRI right after the election um, about what it might mean, what the coalition uh, negotiations might bring. Now we know we have a list of uh, members of the government. We know that the, the, the traffic light parties were indeed able to pull together a government. They have a, a government, uh, a a coalition agreement of about 178 pages that lays out all of their government's policies, which we're going to talk about. We're going to talk largely about foreign policy, but um, our, we are open to your questions on just about anything. I, I can say what is very interesting about this three-way split that we will go into talking to is usually we've had two-way splits in Germany, and that has led to the chancellor being of the bigger party and the foreign minister being of the smaller of the two coalition parties, which usually means that foreign policy is a, a two-way deal. This time it's a little different because you have the chancellor is indeed from the bigger party, the SPD. The, um, the foreign minister is from the next biggest party, the Greens, that's Annalena Baerbock. But the third party in the coalition, the Free Democrats, um, they have foreign policy ideas too. And it will be interesting to see how they manage to make those work and whether the fact that there are two smaller parties, will that lead to uh, sort of a three-way split or will it simply lead to what often happens and that is the chancellery deciding to control foreign policy itself. And I guess we'll talk about that. But before I say anything else about me, uh, Nick, welcome aboard. Thank you very much. Thank you for everyone for, for joining us. And again, it's uh, right at the start of this new coalition government. Uh, we were lucky for Orbis that we were even uh, prior to uh, the formation of the coalition able to have an interview uh, with the uh, spokesperson, foreign affairs spokesperson for the Social Democrats, Dr. 
uh, uh, Neil Schmid. Uh, we, that interview will be uh, published in full by Orbis in its winter issue, which is forthcoming, but we have excerpted it uh, on the FPRI website. Also a link to it uh, in the chat uh, for those that are interested. Uh, and what that essentially, uh, what, what Dr. Schmidt's uh, take, which I think is one that we will explore in our conversations here, uh, is that because it is a uh, three-way coalition, uh, because in, on many of the issues, two of the coalition partners go in one direction and one of the coalition partners goes in another, and that is not consistently the same group of two and one, uh, but is spread out over the three, the uh, Social Democrats, the Greens, and the Free Democrats, uh, is that uh, this is not a government that can be too revolutionary in any one direction. Uh, any tendencies in one direction are going to be balanced by uh, the coalition partners. And so something that uh, uh, Dr. Schmidt had raised, which I think uh, to start our discussion with, is the essentially the extent to which there's going to be continuity uh, and not necessarily continuity with the Merkel, Angela Merkel grand coalition as it existed at the end of the 2000s or the beginning of the 2010s, but that already in the last several years of uh, Merkel's chancellorship, uh, German foreign policy was evolving. And if I can just uh, end with a quick summary, uh, I like to call it the three re's uh, of understanding where this is going, which is uh, Germany will reevaluate its relationship with China, it will reassess its relationship with Russia, and it seeks to reimagine the Euro Atlantic community, both in terms of reimagining the transatlantic relationship with the United States, uh, but also reimagining what Europe means within the context of the European Union and in the context of NATO. And so the extent to which these trends started in 2017 or 2018, now we have a new team. Uh, it should also worth pointing out that uh, this is a new team with generational transition. Uh, so we are moving very clearly to uh, younger leaders that, that did not grow up with the divided Germany, did not grow up uh, in the shadow of the Cold War. Uh, first time uh, in the coalition government that uh, uh, a minister of ethnic Turkish background is involved. Uh, and so definitely an effort to try to widen uh, what it means to be German and what the German experience will be. Yeah. You, you know, Nick, it's funny because you put it so nicely, right? This interesting challenge with three parties. Um, you would imagine that there's it's going to be hard to move a lot in one direction or another, but it is <clears throat> by virtue of its existence, right? The fact that it's a three-party government and the fact and the, the idea of the people who are in it, there's a sort of there is a revolutionary feel, even if they don't change a thing. Yeah. And and I was thinking about slogans too, is that in back in 1969, when the first SPD government, le, government led by the Social Democrats, is created, the slogan that Willy Brandt, the Chancellor, brought to that was uh, "Mehr Demokratie wagen," right? Dare more democracy. And I noticed that Olaf Scholz, even though nobody thinks of Olaf Scholz as a revolutionary leader, um, his no insults to Olaf Scholz, but yeah. that that um, that he he wanted to propagate this phrase "Mehr Fortschritt wagen," so dare more progress, progress, which is which is interesting, right? Because it's a way to say that you want to do new things, but of course, you know. Progress is both, it both sounds more, sounds like it's got forward motion, but also doesn't necessarily say what direction you're going in either. I guess, I guess if you pick up a copy of the SPD newspaper, Forvents, you know, that you're going forward, wherever going that forward, might be. Yeah. But um, did, when you, when you talk to Dr. Schmidt and in, in, in your studies about this, I mean, do you have a sense of, of what the priorities would be if there's something that they know they want to do that's different? I like the three re's a lot, but yeah. I'm just curious about what that works out to be. Well, and I think that this is what makes this coalition interesting because if this had been the three-way coalition that I think both the Greens and the Social Democrats would have wanted, which with the party of the left, it would have been a different approach. They have brought into this coalition a conservative free market uh, partner. And therefore that means that there are uh, in thinking about how to move forward, uh, the preference particularly of uh, the Greens for, as they call it, a more moral foreign policy, human rights, 
is balanced against, all right, but what's going to keep the German economy humming along? Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the creativity may come from how this coalition, in, in contrast to the grand coalition between the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats and, and, and the uh, CSU uh, that we've seen over the past number of years, is how exactly they're going to do that with regard to Russia, which uh, even under Merkel, uh, a growing sense that engagement with Russia had failed in the sense of producing, you know, that the line 10 years ago was, Russia is going to more or less move along a German path. They're about 10 or 20 years behind, but you know, Putin, Vladimir Putin had the, the moniker of being the German in the Kremlin. And they, you know, the essential was, well, just give them time and they'll they'll get through these bumps in the road. I don't think anyone really in Germany now has that sense, but there's still a sense that on the one hand, you don't like dissidents being imprisoned or poisoned. Uh, you don't like uh, some of the direction of Russian policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia's neighbors. But on the other hand, uh, Russian energy is critical to the uh, functioning of the German economy and by extension, the European economy. So right. is there a way for you to pursue human rights in a different way, but without uh, leading to, to an economic shock? And so uh, that's going to be interesting. Uh, the other thing I think is going to be interesting is uh, particularly uh, with uh, uh, Annalena uh, Baerbach as defense minister, but also I think even with Schultz himself, uh, trying to get out of this trap of viewing defense spending uh, as uh, procurement of mm -hmm. uh, hard power uh, articles, tanks, and so on, and really talking about you know, an integrated approach of all tools of statecraft and that Germany can do more to uh, build up the resilience of the Western alliance for itself and its partners. Uh, and then reimagining that as, hey, what can we do in terms of advancing a technological partnership? And of course, with that, the sense that perhaps Germany's past relationship with China uh, has not, again, as with Russia, has not led to some of the outcomes that, that Germany thought uh, would come from it. And so uh, that's, again, going back to your point about this revolutionary feel, I think that there really is this sense of wanting to kind of configure a German approach that really is fitted to the mid 21st century, mm -hmm. rather than looking back to resetting to 2016 or 2008 or 2000. Right. Well, you know, it's, it's funny because you have the personality, there's you know, personnel is policy up to a point. So yeah. you get, so Annalena Baerbach as, as foreign minister, she is, she's spoken about being tough on China. That's the greens have wanted to yeah. be that way, but you met uh, the, the defense ministry thing is, a, is, is interesting because there was some, an open question of who would be defense minister. And yes. there was actually some speculation that the FDP might get that job of somebody from the FDP that a, an early list had leaked that, which would have sort of reinforced this idea of the sort of three-way split in uh, in security and foreign policy. But in the end, the SPD, the, the, I would have been shocked if the Social Democrats would have allowed anybody else to be defense minister. So they did eventually select someone who was from the SPD, but they picked someone who um, doesn't have any particular experience in defense matters, right? They picked the former justice minister, right, Christina Lambrecht, which, you know, th this is, she's not the first person to be made defense minister who doesn't have experience in defense matters, right? There, this has happened before. What, what people are wondering about is, does she have the heft within the party to to really play a role in these decisions, or is the fact that they picked somebody who is a a good party soldier and a good technocrat who knows how to run a ministry that her job is going to be to keep her head down and not make any trouble and let her boss, the chancellor, uh, make the decisions. And 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 know, thank you for yeah. correcting that because no, yes, no uh, Barabach is the foreign minister, although right. I, and 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 Lambrecht is the uh, is the defense minister. But precisely, I think that point of as you raise the, a, not really someone who's a defense intellectual who has a vision of security, but someone who can run the ministry uh, in a way that uh, sort of keeps that power with the chancellor. And, and, and actually going back to that, raising an interesting question, uh, as you put it, which is, uh, we've seen this already with Russia policy. We saw this under Merkel, that mm -hmm. uh, yes, there was a foreign minister, but Russia policy was very much run out of the chancellor. Uh, Angela Merkel really kept control of that. She did not delegate that to 
uh, you know, to, to other people. And so this question of, uh, you know, is the Russia relationship really Schultz going to claim that? Uh, and also, are the Chinese going to be told, look, you're going to have a foreign minister that's going to make certain pronouncements that you don't like, but, you know, we still have a business relationship. And it will be interesting because for the Chinese perspective, as we've seen in recent years with their wolf warrior approach, they're a lot less willing to kind of take those public scoldings from Western leaders as a price for doing business uh, with the West. So yeah. I think that that relate, you know, we still are unclear about how much of a uh, free reign does the foreign minister get and, and over what issues does the foreign minister get? Will, will uh, Barabak have as, uh, you know, in terms of her portfolio, portfolio versus uh, Schultz saying, you have all of these issues, but these issues are going to be run by my staff out of the chancellery. Right. And, and you know, there, it's interesting because there, there, are, there are traditions in, in German politics of this kind of split. Uh, even when Willy Brandt went from being foreign minister to chancellor, the chancellor, the foreign minister then was from the FDP and Brandt kind of you know, said, well, there are things that are my responsibility. And we've had this, this issue in the United States, right? Presidents who've said, listen, there are foreign policy questions. Richard Nixon famously basically, he basically told yeah. his secretary of state, right? There are foreign policy questions that are, that's me and Henry are going to take care of those. And yeah. you can travel around, you can give the speeches, Bill Rogers. But, but I do think that for the Germans, it will be interesting to figure out, you know, what role does rhetoric play in this yeah. kind of diplomacy? Because the Greens, you know, you know, green politicians like Baerbach, who represent this younger generation, right, they have been saying what's missing from German foreign policy is a moral sense and is a commitment to these sort of bigger planetary issues. And so now you've got one, you know, one of them is, 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 the, is the chief spokesperson for German foreign policy. You can't, you can't just, you can't just act like it doesn't matter what she says. And so um, I, I do wonder how this kind of tug of war which I think is pre-programmed. How does it play out? Just like I wonder when you have the former chairman of the SPD and former Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder, who sits on the board of the company responsible for Nord Stream 2, yeah. which has been, has been an ongoing problem, is so what happens when Russia, when the need to show Russia something might actually cost somebody some money, and Gerhard Schroeder shows up on German TV to explain why you know Germany shouldn't upset the Russians. And that's well, what I, I'm curious about that. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah. No, no. And this, this also leads to another split or tension within the coalition. So we have Robert Hayback essentially taking over the economics and climate portfolios. Uh, you know, no movement on nuclear power for Germany, that they're not going to reopen nuclear plants. They want to maintain their commitments. Uh, and then how do you balance that, as you said, against the relationship with Russia, that natural gas for now and, and hydrogen for the future? Uh, mm -hmm. of, of essentially a German-Russian partnership to develop the hydrogen economy. Um, and, you know, do you ring fence that relationship from disagreements with other, uh, over other parts of Russia's role in, in Europe? Uh, we, we don't know, for example, uh, I, I believe it was announced today that the United States will, will consult now with several leading NATO allies, including Germany, about uh, next steps in talks with the Russians about questions about NATO enlargement and, and NATO's role. And again, from the German side, uh, I think we're, we're, we're going to have that little bit of that head scratch of uh, is what uh, Bauerbach says definitive, is what uh, uh, Lambrecht says definitive, is it really, no, we have to get Schultz uh, on board. Uh, and then this tension of, and this is where we come back to the three Democrats. Uh, that uh, morality in foreign policy is well and good. And I don't think that the free Democrats are amoral or anti-moral, uh, but their approach is also going to be at the end of the day, uh, Germany uh, needs a functioning economy. It needs to uh, make sure that it has rates of economic growth that uh, uh, benefit the citizenry. Uh, and the energy question is, is front and center. We, we already have seen that the... Uh, Stocks of, of natural gas uh, in Germany today are where they should be after you've begun pulling from them at the end of January. So we're at December, uh, we're at December 9th, and uh, the, the amount of gas Germany has in storage is what you would expect to see by the end of January. Uh, and of course, 
will, will, will Russia make up the shortfall? Will the energy come from somewhere else? Or will Germany have to uh, go into some form of, of energy rationing and right. you know that, or, that or do you just cross your fingers and you cross your fingers and hope for global warming and you you hope for a warmer than expected winter right uh and then how that plays out and, and you know who when the trade-offs have to happen who will get the yeah. final call and what will be the the final break my sense and, and ron i'd be interested in your take on this is that the final kind of, it breaks, I think, the way that the, that the social Democrats largely will want it to break, um, that when there's kind of a, you know, we are tied, you know, we have a three-way tie on an issue and essentially the social, de- and then the question for the coalition is at what point do the coalition partners essentially nod and say, for the sake of the coalition, we agree. Um, there was a piece in the national interest today, of course, a, uh, sister publication to Orbis, uh, uh, but essentially saying that uh, th- that the likelihood that this coalition will last its entire term of office is, is, is in doubt because yeah. of these structural things baked into the uh, traffic light uh, scenario. You know, I, I, I love this question because I what, what struck me when I read the coalition agreement is many, especially when it comes to defense policy and even European policy, that what you heard were were very traditional, I would say, social democratic uh, positions in the sense of the social democracy that's that's been running German foreign policy for the past most of the past 16 years. That not only do they say we're we're in favor of more Europe, which is a a, a, a pushback against the more Euroskeptic FDP, but they also come out and say nuclear deterrence is still a centerpiece of European defense which, you know, the, the founders of the Green Party, right, you know, you and I are old enough, Nick, to know, right, that the Green Party is not, not, not the party of NATO's nuclear deterrent, but clearly they swallowed that. Yeah. Um, and they even came out and said they are not opposed to armed drones, right, even though they said that they want to be very careful ab- about, about how this goes. I mean, these are, these were hot button issues that most of the Green Party uh, electorate, and I would say even a big chunk of the FDP electorate were very skeptical about, but they're there in black and white in the coalition agreement, which I think does reflect the, the, the larger influence of the SPD. Now, what happens when the rubber meets the road and there's a question of investing in this or that defense technology? What happens when there's a problem? One other thing I got to throw in, which you talk about things I just read today is, um, you know, President Biden, of course, had his conversation with Vladimir Putin and then said he was going to consult with, quote, leading European powers, which means, you know, the typical, it's like, I'm going to talk to the English, I'm going to talk to the British, I'm going to talk to the French, I'm going to talk to the Germans, and I'm going to talk to the Italians. We got to talk to the Italians because of their role in in, in uh, hydrocarbon extraction, yeah. basically, right? He did not say, I'm going to talk to the Estonians, I'm going to talk to the Poles, right? Because basically, because when you know what people are going to say, you don't want to talk to them until you know what your answer is going to be, right? But it is worth noting that both Baerbach and Schultz, they they announced where their first trips were going to be in yeah. office. And they, they've they always mentioned Paris. Paris has to come first for Germans. They mentioned Washington. Both of them are planning to visit Warsaw um, in the near future. And that, I think, is an interesting gesture by the German government. So it'll be interesting. What does Annalena Baerbach say when she's in Warsaw? What does Olaf Schultz say when she's in Warsaw? Especially because we know that neither Baerbach nor Schultz is big fans of the current government in Poland, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, yet, and this is... Yeah, go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. No. no but that, that, So my, my last thought is, so you know, they're not fans of the government in Poland, but they have to be, you know, they are interested. Germany wants to show solidarity with the Poles if they're faced with Russian aggression on their border. So what do you think? But, but then, as, as you just said, though, they're not fans of the current government. And again, we have one of these rubber hitting the road things, which is, so when, when Baerbach visits Warsaw, let's say in her capacity, let's assume she's the first to go, right. and is standing and saying, we stand with you in solidarity against Russia. And now here's a list of our complaints about your internal domestic policies, uh, starting with LBGTQ and other issues where uh, we don't, you know, we, we must now also tell you, you know, we don't think that you're in line with kind of the, the small L liberal, uh, small D democratic values of, of, of Western and, and Central Europe. And again, uh, where, where is the trade-off? Uh, yeah. And the same thing with, with, with uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary and with some of the other uh, tendencies in kind of Central and East Europe. Uh, 
you know, where, where, where will the Greens go? And I think, and your point early, just to go back to your earlier point, that yes, the Greens, the Greens, the earlier generation of Greens are, are, I would say, either have adapted and said, well, this is how we've evolved or how far we have moved because, you know, 30 years ago, the great fear in Washington was Greens in government. Yeah. We thought they were anti-NATO. They would take Germany out of NATO. They were soft on the Soviets. They would be soft on European security. Uh, and it almost seemed in the run-up to the election, there was a point at which Washington seemed actually to be rooting for the Greens to, to be the a bigger player right. in a post-election uh, government than, than they ended up being. That we actually thought that on, on Russia, on NATO, on a variety of issues that the Greens would actually be uh, stronger uh, than even the than even the, uh, the Social Democrats. So again, that that's a, a very interesting sea change yeah. in in how the uh, how the how the Greens perceive themselves. I, I can't help. It, I don't mean this as an uncharitable comment as well, but also watching how this coalition came together, I couldn't escape the the similarities with watching what the uh, uh, liberal Democrats in Britain did a few years back in entering into a coalition and in so doing kind of prepared to walk away from some of their essentially saying we have core positions, but actually being a governing party, which we don't really have an option to be on our own. Uh, we're willing to go into coalition with the with the conservatives if we actually get a taste of of actually being in charge of something for a change rather than yeah. always being on the outs. And again, to what extent with the free Democrats and the Greens looking at this coalition deal, which, as you said, you know, hundred and some pages, carefully spaced, carefully font uh, delivered, uh, that spells everything out. Said, you know, we can be an opposition party or be out of government, or we can uh, compromise so that we can be in the tent. And and I think the fact that both party, uh, the, both of the parties in ratifying the coalition essentially have signaled. Uh, they want a shot at governance rather than just simply to be pure in opposition. Indeed. And that's what what's really interesting is of the three parties, the Greens are the only one that, according to their rules, let their entire membership vote on whether to yeah. join the government. So that so that is another sense that, you know, the party as a whole, you know, they were they, they saw the agreement, they heard what was in it and they decided we're going to be in favor of it. So everybody's decided to give this a shot. I have one random comment that I have to bring in because I know and I know you'll get a kick out of this is the way you described the problem is what happens when Elena Baerbach goes to Warsaw. We've already seen what can happen. Yeah. When somebody, I was thinking, Marine Le Pen went to ah. Warsaw, right? Just last week. <laughs> yeah. And and of course, she loves the government in Warsaw, right? Yeah. And she loves all that social stuff. But then she hadn't even left Warsaw, I don't think, when she gave an interview to, um, a, to a news outlet, which basically said Ukraine is Russian territory. Yeah. Um, because you know she knows what side her bread's buttered on, and so so you know the the polls I guess are going to have to deal with the the fact of that they have their people pull in multiple directions. But it does yeah. it does raise the question of you know what is what is truly important, right? And what is you know and and how do we understand the the goals of particular actors, especially when it kind of comes to dealing with Russia? Yeah. Nick, I want to I want to pull in uh, Ralph Humphreys asked a couple of questions on the on the Q and A, and I want to let everybody know out there that we do indeed take questions on the Q and A. Um, and I, I want to combine them in an interesting way. I mean, one is he asked the question about nuclear power. And I think we talked about this, right? That the Greens, of course, and even the Social Democrats have decided we're not going to, um, you know, we're not going back to nuclear power, even if it challenges, it creates problems with Russia. But I want to talk about that. But he also asked the question about German identity and that the Greens, you know, I, I you know, as, as fate would have it, Right, I, um, the the Minister of Agriculture Chem Özdemir um, yeah. is a is, is has been a longtime Green politician. His parents were born in Turkey. He was born in Germany, but he's a relatively rare example of somebody who has been able to, uh, you know, just sort of get through the hurdles, become a full citizen, and and as a and as a, a member of government, that this this is an openness to immigration and to naturalization. That, as we know, the G German law doesn't, uh, you know, it was not yeah. built that way. And yeah. so this is a big push. And previous social democratic green government tried to push this and were essentially pushed back on. And so in both the nuclear power question, let's say, and the migration question, how should we understand, you know, what this government is both what is likely to want to do and what are they likely to be able to do? Yeah. 
Let me start with uh, the, I'll start with nuclear power and then go to, to migration. I think the sure. nuclear power question uh, is one, and, and, and this actually brings a point that, that uh, Schmidt raised in the interview, mm -hmm. which is a very pragmatic one. He said, you cannot sell policies on climate change to an electorate by saying, we are going to uh, beggar you. We're going to, uh, you're going to be poor as a result of this. So I right. think that if you've taken nuclear off the table, if you are committed to your uh, climate change goals, uh, it will require some accommodation with Russia. And I think that because other sources of gas, you know, uh, aren't, aren't quickly available, uh, or, you know, in the case of Iran, is Iran, a, you know, does Iran have is that, is that moral, moral <laughs> uh, uh, issues for the Greens? Uh, than Russia. And I think you're going to, that I think is one of those immediate issues where, uh, and this is why um, uh, Katya Yefimova from Oxford Energy is essentially, her analysis is uh, Nord Stream 2 under this government likely to go through. There may be some additional conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, the Russians may find it harder to swallow some of it. There might be, look, you'll need to continue gas transit through Ukraine beyond 2024. But the analysis is, is that you can't, yeah, uh, you, uh, as as Pope John Paul the first liked to say, you can't make gnocchi out of this dough. Uh, apparently, that was one of the sayings, which I, I know I'm it's not. I'm, I, I'm writing that one down, Nick. That's yeah, a, that's a nice one. That's okay. a good. Right, you can't you can't do all of these. Uh, you're going to probably have to make some kind of arrangement with Russia. Uh, will the Russians make some token concessions on the human rights issues? That that's a possibility, but I think that's. The, the, commit, the uh, thing against nuclear power, I think, is so strongly ingrained um, that, that's not, that that's not going to move. And then the question of, well, do we go to brownouts four hours a day in order not to get gas from Russia? Um, so I think that that will be a test, but I think that's how this government will get through it. On the identity question, I think what's going to be interesting is the extent to which does Germany, first of all, does it revisit its you know, up to 1999, it had a pretty similar law of return, right? If you could show that you were of German descent, you could come back. And then, of course, the concern was is that you were being overwhelmed by migrants from the former Soviet Union that had very tenuous German connections, but were able to say, well, I had a great, great grandmother who was a Volga German, and therefore, please let me in. And so it was kind of right, we're going to stop that. One, do you revisit that? in light of that. The second is, do you start moving Germany down, say, a Canadian or Australian model of we are open to immigration, but it's going to be skills-based, it's going to be what can you contribute, and, you know, and, and then the language question, certainly. I mean, I know that this has been, you know, in, in certain parts of Germany, uh, uh, really, since 2015, the sense that you've had a great wave of migration into Germany, uh, to what extent have those migrants been able to learn German or function in German? That's been a sticking point. So that might be the, the compromise moving forward that, uh, uh, hey, you want to be a part of Germany, but we want to see the skills you're going to bring. We want to see the language uh, ability that you have. Um, but I think, it, again, it, because of the way this coalition is set up, it's going to be interesting. But I think you could actually have an, a horseshoe that bends, which is, the Free Democrats looking at this from a labor perspective, and perhaps the Greens from the and the SPD from the humanitarian perspective, saying we can agree on a on a compromise approach that says let's start uh, let's start looking at you know migrants that can be uh, can contribute to the economy and that are um, I guess the term would be uh, Germanizable or Germanize mm -hmm. something of that of that line where they can right. you can feel that they'll be integrated. Because so I think you're going to have the sense that you don't want to follow perhaps the French model of of kind of populations that uh, increasingly are are kind of seen uh, as separate from the uh, from right. the larger larger and society. No, no uh, parallel societies, right? That's yeah. the the thing that they don't like. Well, you know, and and it's funny, right? That the the German. <clears throat> uh, 
emphasis on you know who your grandparents were where it created all these weird situations where yeah. you essentially had the grandchildren of collaborators with the nazis had a stronger claim on german citizenship <laughs> than yeah. than, vic than victims of the nazis did which yes. is you know, that's that that's not good for anybody but it does you know the fdp's position on migration you know the fdp before they decided to decide before they decided to become the the furthest right group in a left wing coalition when they weren't sure where they were going they flirted very heavily with some uh, anti-migrant sentiments yeah. and with to, to because like a lot of liberal parties right they have tried to decide right are they you know because they've they've lost a lot of voters to the yeah. alternative for germany and they said yeah. so should we yeah, move to the right to get them back um and so that will be an interesting thing to watch um I, I see a couple of big questions have come up that I guess we we should probably address. And one is Matthew Kennedy asks about the German attitude on Taiwan. I want to broaden that a little more. And that is, how do we understand German policy towards China? Since we know that, you know, is it is it simple enough to say, right, German business, you know, they, they buy a lot of cars in China, so we don't want to upset the Chinese. Because that certainly appears to have been Angela Merkel's foreign policy on China in yeah. one sense. And yet, so where does that go if if... If, if the Germans view China as simply too valuable to lose, does that mean that they will acquiesce as they have acquiesced largely in a lot of other things the Chinese do? Does that mean that they would acquiesce if there was any crisis anyplace else? And, and will they criticize the US for uh, escalation if the US talks too much about, about Taiwan or about all these sorts of things? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know if, if Schmidt talked about this in the interview or if you have a sense of, of that. He, I think the sense is, is that Germany the, the, what Germany needs to rebalance its position vis-a-vis -vis China. Mm -hmm. uh, China will still be an important economic player, but it's important for uh, Germany not to be uh, sort of overly dependent on the Chinese market uh, and to be aware of the strings that China seeks to, to, to use to uh, con constrain German, Germany's freedom of action. And certainly, uh, you know, a point that I think that people are waking up to is that China, we, we often think about this as in the, from Russia's perspective, but China is also very interested in the divorce of the transatlantic community. If they can find ways to divorce Europe from the United States and Canada, that uh, they're not averse to that either. So I think you have that recognition um, that uh, there's a sense that uh, China may be trying to do that. On the other hand, I do think in Germany, you still have across the board, across the parties, I wouldn't necessarily say this is explicitly in one party or not, that there's a degree of caution that Germany and by extension Europe not be drawn into a Chinese-American clash in the Pacific yeah. that does not concern Europe. Now, the Germans sent, you know, there's a German vessel that is part of the, you know, as part of these uh, exercises in the Pacific. And that I think was a very dramatic signal uh, of Germany's interest with the alliance. Uh, the question about Taiwan more specifically, uh, because I don't want to lose sight of, of, mm -hmm. his, of that question there, I think is going to be very interesting because, and but this is also going to depend to some extent on what we, the United States, are able to do, because I think there's a very real interest in Germany about reorienting supply chains, mm -hmm. reorienting partnerships, particularly in technology, new technologies, pharmaceuticals and the like. Um, and obviously interest in India, interest in the Quad, interest in Taiwan. But the linchpin of that is also what can the United States do? Mm -hmm. And I think you have a German coalition that is looking at particularly the Biden administration that is very hopeful, but is also concerned that you have U.S. politics that are unable to really um, be flexible enough to embrace or see the opportunities of the mid 21st century. Yeah. Uh, and so that, you know, if you could create the resilient supply chain that kind of de-emphasizes China, emphasizes, you know, Japan and Australia to Taiwan through to India and then to, to Europe and the United States, uh, on paper, it sounds good. But again, where the free Democrats will come back in is they're going to say, okay, all very good on paper. What's the bottom line? What's the bottom line? And, yeah. and, and I want to, just one thing that I forgot to bring earlier, I think you were talking about the defense ministry. I actually think that the free Democrats in some ways, you know, putting, um, uh, 
uh, uh, um, uh, Lindner, Christian yes, Lindner, Christian into, Lindner, yes, uh, into the into the finance ministry. In fact, was their view that in many ways that's the that's a, a third power ministry, right? And right. That, I think that's their ability to say human rights, all of these other things, but at the end of the day, you know, what's the balance sheet look like? And I yeah. think that to the extent now the Taiwan thing, and I think this also there's a um, I didn't want to um, uh, get, uh, I saw this in the, I have the chat box open sure. that Tom Vernon asked about NATO membership for Ukraine, yeah. but the Taiwan and Ukraine in some ways are, are related issues in the sense that I think you have a cautiousness in Germany about uh, being sanguine about conflicts with other major powers, particularly military powers. And so I think you have this caution with regard to Taiwan. And I think also this caution with regard to Ukraine. Yeah. Um, that uh, on the one hand, you don't want to cede a sphere of influence to the Russians, but I think the Germans have been more open in the past to uh, pulling back on the forward presence and, and saying, let's create some space. And, um, and of course, the German position, I think, on you, I don't think it's going to change much. I think the position has always been uh, the, the Bucharest compromise of uh, uh, Ukraine, of course, Ukraine is a European state that should be in NATO one day, yep. but we don't expect that day anytime soon. Don't ask us for a timetable, but for now, um, we don't. We're not going to accelerate it, um, and that'll be interesting. With the first visit, uh, you know, circling back to your point, when uh, Baerbach and Schultz go to Warsaw, yep. and the polls are essentially saying. Uh, we were to you in NATO enlargement. Ukraine is to us what we were to you, right? We're right. we're extending the zone further away from from us, and it'll be interesting what the German response will be. I totally agree. And I see Walter McDougall also asked us a question about Ukraine. Nice to know Walters Walters out there, and uh, and your and Walter points out right that Germany, of course, militarily can do very little. Um, the question is, what does NATO do? And what is the German position? Right? In the coalition agreement, <clears throat> there's nothing specific said, specifically said about expanding NATO, certainly no. not. I mean, the, the focus is on right, encouraging the Russians to pursue diplomacy rather than military threats. Um, so in a sense, right, you know, the, the, the German position on these things, which is largely synonymous with the European position, which is largely frustrating in the eyes of anybody who wishes that Europe showed some backbone, is they say, we really don't want Russia to do anything mean, and we would like very much to avoid them doing anything too aggressive for too long. Um, if they do do something aggressive, we sure hope the Americans are ready to respond. And if the Americans do respond, which I, I think that it's likely that Americans would respond in some way, but I, I don't speak for anybody in the U.S. government on that. <laughs> um, <laughs> goodness knows. But, um, but that, that if the United States does decide to respond, then the, your, the, the, I think that the Germans would, um, would be able to hide within the, the large cloak that is NATO and say, you know, we support the American, we, we support this action. But I think that the initiative is squarely in the hands of the Russians here, right? That yeah. there's that the, the Germans, the Germans have, they have stationed small units further east, right? They, they are participated a little bit in the forward presence in yeah. Russia, in, in Poland and in the Baltic Republic and yeah. Lithuania, right? So they're not, the Germans have, have lived up to their commitments within NATO. And I assume that's what the, even this coalition, which still says they're committed to NATO, still says they're committed to transatlantic uh, relations, that that's what they're going to do. But the, but the initiative is very much in Russian hands. And it's also worth noting, I mean, this is one of the great paradoxes. And this is my big struggle with, <clears throat> with uh, friends and colleagues who are who consider themselves capital R realists. And they're, they, they, many of them spent, have spent the past few days saying, what the United States and NATO need to do to solve this problem is just to come out and say, Ukraine will never be a member of NATO, and that'll satisfy the Russians and they'll be happy. No. No, no. <laughs> first of all, right. First of all, you know, it, it shouldn't be the United States and, and democracy should not be uh, essentially stripping away the possibility that other states can make sovereign choices about the alliances they want to join. Right. It's pretty clear to anybody with half a brain that they, that Ukraine is not going to join NATO anytime in the near future. And it's worth noting that in 2014, when it was very clear 
that that Ukraine was not going to be a member of NATO because after all the Russians had shown in 2008 with the way they treated Georgia, yeah. um, that they had shown that they're not going to be a member of NATO. That the idea in 2000 by 2014 was we understand Ukraine won't be a member of NATO and nobody wants Ukraine to be a member of NATO, but we would like Ukraine as a European power to have the option to be part of this larger economic world that is the European Union. Vladimir Putin treated the prospect of, your, of Ukrainian membership in the EU as exactly the same thing, same thing as NATO. And that's what led to the intervention that we saw in 2014. Putin does not make a distinction between, and, and Russia, Russia's view for Ukraine makes no distinction between the, the peaceful membership in the EU and the membership of NATO. And that means that there is only one thing the Russians want out of Ukraine. And that is they want Ukraine to do what Moscow wants Ukraine to do when Moscow decides what they want Ukraine to do. And to think that there's any kind of diplomacy that's going to say, well, you know, we'll promise not to do anything that Russia doesn't like, that, that, that continues to leave the initiative in the hands of the Russians. Yeah. And I think that's going to be the challenge for, the, for this government, for the Biden administration, but also for this German government is how do you find a way to to make a Western position clear enough and strong enough that you're not simply sort of sitting back and saying, oh, gosh, I hope the Russians don't plan to do anything. Yeah. Well, and this, I think, ties both to, to Walter's question, but also <clears throat> to, to Robert Torgerson's question uh, at the top about, you know, what what is it that allows you uh, to exercise deterrence and to some extent, compellence. And mm -hmm. is it hard military power? Uh, if Germany is not going that direction, so, uh, you know, he asks about stronger diplomacy with technology development. And that, I think, by the way, comes back to something that uh, Schmidt in his interview talks about, which is reimagining uh, the transatlantic relationship, um, not just simply in, in traditional security terms, but very much in terms of technology. That, that, that this needs to be a driving force. And of course, Russia needs that technology. That has been a big part of Russia's own development strategy is the symbiotic relationship between Russian resources and German technology. And is that therefore uh, a tool of both deterrence and compellence? Uh, today, I'm a, as of today, I'm uh, a, a bit uh, less sanguine on this because you know yesterday we had uh, I believe it was uh, Jake Sullivan announcing this, that yes, we're consulting with the Germans and we have all agreed. And, and of course, this was the message apparently transmitted to staffers on the Hill that yes, the United States and Germany have agreed that aggressive action against Ukraine will result in the termination of, of Nord Stream or no use of Nord Stream. And then today we're getting a bit of that, uh, you know, it depends on what the definition of is is. Uh, if, it's, if it's real, well, if it's real aggression, right? is it Isn't real? That the well, and apparently the, the 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 sticking point is well, invasion. What is an invasion actually? And just because there may be forces, is that really? You know, and and so if you're going to have that approach, that really undermines the the, the effectiveness of deterrence by by punishment. Uh, if you're saying, look, we can't stop the the Russians from moving further into Ukraine in a military sense. We think that there are risks, and in, in, in Germany, this goes back to, to both Roberts and, and, and Walter's question, that Germany doesn't have the wherewithal for deterrence by denial, mm -hmm. but it does have wherewithal for deterrence by punishment, but you have to believe that you're actually going to exercise that. Right. Um, and, and, you know, as of December 8th, you know, <laughs> uh, we have some questions. Now, the coalition may settle this, they may come to an agreement to say this is what we will define as you know we will implement these agreements and of course that was always the 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 the, the uh, weak point as it were of the earlier informal biden merkel arrangement on nord stream which was you know we will agree that you know if russia does certain things but then the the, the proof was in the pudding of well we all have to agree on what those things are and what the level of attribution is so yeah. Um, we're we're back to the, the that that problem in any kind of of agreement, yeah. right? Is that in the event of a crisis, are you prom are you promise 
are you promising that you will act or are you promising that you will consult and consider acting? Consult right? and consider those, those acting. Are, they're not the same. Those aren't the same kind of promises. And, you know, and I understand everybody wants to maintain a degree of flexibility. And with, you know, to go to, to, to Bob's question, you know, also the technological one is an interesting one about the longer term question of NATO military cooperation, right? That is it really worth it to tell the Europeans how much they have to spend? Or should we be thinking about what it is that NATO should be able to do? Right. I mean, because if you add up, as I, I bore my classes with this all the time, Nick, so I'm going to bore you and everybody listening. Right. If you add up the defense budgets of all of the European members of NATO, you get the second largest defense budget in the world. Yeah. So they're spending plenty of money, but clearly they're not spending enough money on the things that would actually give them capabilities to be, to act um, in, in the face of real threats. And so no, if, this, if, yeah. yeah, if your defense budget is largely personnel costs, Right. or for military forces that don't aren't expeditionary aren't flexible aren't resilient then and that has been i mean there, that has been part of the german pushback in the past and that's going to be interesting to see what lambrecht does is she right. going to push back uh with with uh, lloyd austin and others to say it's the quality of our spending that's going to matter and are we going to spend not on armed formations but on on the technologies right and particularly right. if we move if 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 the germans decide look the way forward is to really spend on porcupine defense technologies uh rather than on you know large-scale expeditionary forces um but that again you know remains to be seen and you know and especially with the tripartite coalition you know they're gonna have to negotiate within before they'll even be able to 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 come to the rest yeah, and since Lindner as finance minister, right, you know, the, the whole the whole promise of the FDP going into this coalition is we know they want to spend a lot of money, but don't worry, Christian's going to make sure that we don't overspend. No new taxes. Yeah, no right? new taxes, That's, right? Yeah. And 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 what does that look like if you're talking about the increasing the size of the defense budget? Which gets to the technological question I see that Charles Burhan is asking as well is so you mentioned about energy. So no nuclear power. Um, kind of don't want to have to buy all that stuff from the Russians, but kind of are, right? And kind of still burning coal in some places, which is which ain't all that great. So wind and solar are the technology, wind, wind and solar now and hydrogen someday. Um, should we, you know, in, in what ways is Germany working with its European neighbors? This is something I'm curious about too, right? In what ways is Germany working with its European or its global partners? To develop these kinds of technologies or is it just you know wind and solar wind and solar somebody somebody until somebody comes up with something better. until somebody comes up with it i think i think that's something we really have to to to, to pay attention with because mm -hmm. one reason why europe and germany in particular is in the uh deficit or i should say deficit because they have energy in storage <clears> just not as much as they expected is that over reliance you know it was not as windy <laughs> on the Baltic coast is expected. <laughs> it hasn't been as sunny uh, as people had hoped. So your, you know, wind and solar didn't produce the levels that they were expected. Um, and if you're not going nuclear, uh, I mean, I guess you could say, try to get around it by saying, we're not going to go nuclear, but we'll encourage Austria, the Czech Republic, Poland, everyone to go really nuclear and sell us the electricity. <laughs> um, that could be, but we come back. I mean, I think this is why the energy question is the fundamental thing that the Russia policy of Germany will founder on, which is that at the end of the day, they need the energy. They're not going to get it from other sources. The Trump administration offered, you know, had an energy plan, uh, which did not, you know, has not survived into the new administration. Um, and, you know, for, for important reasons, I understand why the, the Biden team has done that. But I mean, that, that option is now off the table. And with hydrogen, yes, precisely because of the energy consumption is you're likely to have German business say, it's easier for us to produce this hydrogen in the Russian Arctic to produce the blue hydrogen and the green, the blue hydrogen using the natural gas, producing the green hydrogen, and then saying we already have a natural gas delivery infrastructure, we'll just retrofit that for hydrogen. Um, and then we're back to the question that we have, you know, it's amazing how this question keeps coming back from the 1980s to today, this, yeah. you know, that if you're gonna rely on Siberia for your energy, 
you know that has <laughs> that that has ramifications, and um, I don't know that the coalition, uh, as of yet, has really thought through this. The the, the sort of green mm -hmm. approach of well, just use less energy. Um, you know, you know, okay, use less energy. That's not really gonna. I, I don't think that's gonna fly. Uh, you can be more efficient in your use of energy, certainly, and I think Germany already is, but uh, fundamentally, uh, German, you know, and that, again, that goes back to the decisions that were made 20 years ago, the idea that mm -hmm. Russia was going to be Germany's uh, provider of resources, that symbiotic relationship, um, and having made that marriage, it's it's hard to divorce hard at to this divorce. point. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, since we're FPRI and we talk about geopolitics, actually, yesterday I was doing a seminar for high school students on geopolitics. And I talked about Halford McKinder. We, mm -hmm. uh, when you say, you know, if you get your energy from Siberia, right, that does tend to yeah. give that uh, privileges the world, the center of the world island, right? The great <laughs> yes, heartland. <laughs> that's where the power comes from, right? And that that still has an enormous degree of influence. And, and you know, it is interesting, right, that in, for another conversation is, you know, how well the Russians have or have not actually played this card, that in some ways, right, their, their refusal to accept the possibility that the EU need not be a threat yeah. has poisoned relations with the West in a way that's, that really doesn't serve Russian interests at all. Um, and we haven't had a chance to talk a lot about European policy, which we, uh, yeah. uh, the, the idea is the, the coalition says they're still in favor of it, right? Everybody's still in favor. They also say they want to stay friends with Great Britain, which is nice. It's an important thing to say. Um, but the big question is, 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 you know, and we're just about out of time, unfortunately, we've, we've worked through our questions, but the, um, you know, the idea of uh, Germany wanting to, what, what the Germans have wanted basically since, gosh, I don't know, since 1949, is a stable, and certainly since 1990, is a stable status quo, let's say since reunification, is they would like a stable status quo in which the German economy can continue to, to, to pump out the exports so that they can continue to live the life they want to live. One that doesn't require Germany to make too many difficult decisions, geopolitical decisions, because they will strain the, the largely pacifist consensus that dominates much of German politics. And so we can see this government will maintain that continuity as well, is that they would like things just to continue stable. The big question is whether the world's going to cooperate. And I think it's more likely that the world's not going to cooperate and we have to see how they respond. Well, and, and first and foremost, we need to know who's going to be sitting in the LSA palace next year. And there uh, you go, right? So, <laughs> since we mentioned Marine Le Pen, right? We yeah. say, is it, does Emmanuel Macron keep his job? So who's the leader of the free world now that yeah. Angela Merkel is gone? Well, I think right now we don't have, well, I mean, I think you have, you know, obviously President Biden would like to reclaim that mantle. He will. Uh, but I don't know where this is, where this is going to go. And I think also, and just as we're closing up, the generational thing matters here again, because certainly, you know, Germany's policy towards Europe was grounded in partly a sense of atonement for the Second World War, partly a sense that, as you said, Germany didn't want to have to make certain hard geopolitical decisions. And so embedding itself within the European Union and NATO allowed the decisions to be done by, by others. Um, the sense that you know, Germany needs to, as people say, step up more. Uh, but the question is, is well, how will they step up? Uh, will they step up? Uh, and does a current and future generation of, of German political leaders feel that they must continue to underwrite uh, European spending and consumption in the ways that earlier generations of German leaders felt it was an absolute, uh, absolute imperative? Um, and then this goes right back to relationship with Poland, relationship with Greece, relationship with Hungary, uh, you know, the sense of everyone doesn't like us, but everyone has their hand out for, uh, for the checks. And at what point do Germans say, can we still have our lifestyle without having to sign some of those checks? I, I don't know where this is going to head. And again, you know, this is in a way, um, you know, a first post post Cold War German government, because Merkel, I think, really was the the last of the post Cold War chancellors. Um, uh, Schultz, of course, generate, but I'm just saying, you know, thinking yeah. about, as you said, forwards, progress, right? <laughs> progress, and, and right. Moving yeah. forward is, you know, this is not the world of night of post 1990. And, and I don't know where that where that goes. And it's how that 
how that relates and how, as you said, the German relationship with England, uh, mm -hmm. all of these things I think are up for grabs and are probably best uh, to be addressed in future future seminars, future seminars, future conversations. I mean, and that's basically it, right? That, that uh, it is a new generation. It is a new government. It's a new experiment for the Germans. And that means uncertain times for everybody. Um, we hope that this conversation for all of you who've stuck with us all the way through it, that you have gotten some sense of what the stakes are and what the issues are. We, of course, at FPRI and especially at Orbis and in our other conversations, we will come back to these questions and we hope that you out there will come back to them. We hope that if this is the first FPRI event that you've participated in, that you will tell a friend and that you'll bring a friend next time, that you will consider offering your support for the kind of work that we do here at FPRI that makes conversations like this possible. Nick, it's been a real pleasure. Real Thanks pleasure, so much. Ron. And then thank you to everybody else. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again. And until next time, bye-bye for all of us at FPRI.